I want to turn in your turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, I'm going to read verses 50 through 58, but uh, also be advised that I'm going to be uh, highlighting a lot of other verses and passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, uh, but I'll concentrate, at least in my reading of Scripture, on verses 50 through 51, 58 of uh, 1 Corinthians 15. So, uh, I read from the uh, NIV. I'll begin reading. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you, mystery will not all sleep, but we will be all changed in a flash and the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let me pray. Dear Lord, we pray to bless this passage. Pray that uh, as the message is brought forth tonight, that uh, people will know and, and believe that it is your word. And we just pray for a good blessing tonight, and we thank you for what you are doing and what you will be doing tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Back in uh, September 1901, uh, the coffin uh, that contained the remains of Abraham Lincoln was to, uh, was to be placed back in the Lincoln tomb because the actual tomb at that time had started to deteriorate, so they needed to rebuild almost the entire Lincoln tomb. Has anybody ever been to Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois, and saw that? Well, they needed to replace it. So they took the coffin of Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Lincoln and his son Tad, I believe, or Willie. And uh, then they, when it was finished, they put the coffin back in to uh, Lincoln's tomb. And uh, before they did, uh, there were a group of people, dignitaries, that wanted to make sure in that body inside the coffin was, in fact, Abraham Lincoln. So they unscrewed it, <laughs> and they opened the coffin, and there was Abraham Lincoln, perfectly preserved, assassinated in 1865, and years later, in 1901, they opened the casket, and there was Abraham Lincoln, perfectly preserved, no mistaking that it was his. Even the wart on his cheek and the tuft of his beard was there and his hair and all that, perfectly preserved. But you know, even if our bodies once laid in the grave are perfectly preserved like Lincoln's, or it's decayed, or it turns to dust, or it's vaporized, you know, in some explosion, it doesn't make any difference because once we die, we know that our spirit, our soul, the pneuma, uh, the, our spirit our soul, goes immediately into the presence of the Lord, doesn't it? But our body is in the tomb, wherever it is. And what is it doing? Our body is wait, awaiting the resurrection. We believe that because that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. But you see, if there was no resurrection of the body, the best anyone could say if they opened up our coffin would be, my, he's well preserved. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. But we believe it goes much further than that. That's why 1 Corinthians has a lot to say about our bodies and life after death. As a matter of fact, chapter 15 is absolutely essential. It's absolutely vital to our Christian faith because it's foundational to what we believe. More than any other chapter in the Bible, I believe chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians touches on the resurrection more than any other chapter in, in the Bible. 
And it says there, Jesus Christ is a first fruits, and we who, who, we who are in Christ will follow. So if Christ is resurrected, we will soon follow with our resurrected bodies. So if you look at chapter 15 as part of, as part of Paul's entire letter, letter to the Corinthians, if you, learned, if, you whole, if you read the whole book of Corinthians, you'd find out that church had a lot of problems. You know, they were suing each other. There was a sexual immorality. Uh, there was uh, this problem with Christian liberty. They were misusing the Lord's Supper. It was just a very carnal church, and that's why it's often called the Crudding Corinthians, the Cruddy Corinthians. Of course, in chapter the second, in the Second Corinthians chapter, the, the next, cha, the next book, Second Corinthians, they did a lot better. But this first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he had a lot to say. But one issue that really stood out in this church was regarding the resurrection of the dead. Specifically, the resurrection of believers in Christ. But the problem the Corinthian church had was that. Um, there was some thinking, it was, it was called Hellenistic thinking. That's Greek thinking. Corinth was a Greek city. And if you know anything about Hellenism, that's Greek culture, Greek thinking, Greek language, and all that. And Hellenistic philosophy held that the body was inherently evil, that only the spirit could live beyond the grave. Matter of fact, the Greek philosopher Plutarch, Plutarch stated that only the soul and the sp those of the soul or the spirit could attain to the realm of the gods through freeing itself of the attachment to the senses and becoming pure, fleshless, and undefiled. Thus, the body could not be attached to the soul because the body was inherently evil. So the soul and the spirit would want nothing to do with the body. Matter of fact, turn over to Acts chapter 17. Turn over to Acts chapter 17, verses 31 and 32. Now, where's Paul in Acts chapter 17? He's in Athens, in Greece, and he's speaking at Mars Hill. And he says in verse 31 of Acts 17, For the Lord has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Now what happened in 32? And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. So a lot of these Greeks, they said, No way. No way. So let's go back to chapter 15 of Corinthians, and let's look at verse 42. Because here's Paul's counter, Paul counters this thinking by stating in verse 42, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead, the body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. So when he says, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead, in the original Greek, he would just as easily say, the rising of the corpses. So when Paul speaks of the resurrection of the dead, would have sounded to some of these Corinthians as appalling, sure foolishness, even horrific, icky. You know, they wouldn't think of that. So that's one possible reason why Paul had to, uh, had to uh, you know, direct his teaching in that regard. But another possible reason was the influence of the Jewish thinking, too. There was a group called the Sadducees. And um, you've heard of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes. But the Sadducees didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't even believe there was a resurrection of the spirits. So they were sad, you see. <laughs> That's an old one, sorry. So the fact of Greek thinking and Jewish thinking kind of, a, kind of deterred people from thinking that the actual body, this body that, that I'm composed of, this tent, actually is going to be resurrected. And Paul was saying that that's true, and I'm going to tell you why. So as you read the entire chapter, and I've only read uh, just a few verses, that's whole, Paul's whole, whole theme is the resurrection of the dead is a fundamental truth of the gospel. It's a triumph over death. It's a future hope that our bodies will be transformed in the resurrection. Therefore, the resurrection is not an escape from the body, 
the resurrection is in fact the uniting of body and spirit together. Matter of fact, um, turn to here's another one. Here's a good passage. Turn over to Romans chapter eight, verse twenty-three. Romans chapter eight. where he says this. It says, not only Romans 8, 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of what? Our bodies. Okay. okay. Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for another reference that Paul made. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at verses 1 through 4. In Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, where he says this, Now we know that if the earthly tent, what's he talking about? He's talking about our bodies. Now if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, and where it decays, it goes to dust, we have an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, our heavenly body, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, this body, we groan, don't we? And we're burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So Paul is pretty distinct in teaching that there is a bodily resurrection, and we're not only going to our spirit and our soul, but we're going to have a body to it. You've heard of, uh, ever read uh, Joel Rosenberg's uh, books, The Case for Christ and all that? I'm sure you have. Even the movie's out. But uh, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at verses 3 through 8 because Paul gives the original case for Christ's resurrection. Look at that. Look at verse 3. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. What Scripture is that? Is that the New Testament? No, it's the Old Testament. You know, there's always 300 prophecies regarding Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And Paul is saying Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to what? According to the Scriptures. You need only to look at uh, Psalms 16, 9 through 11, Hosea 6, 2, Jonah 1, 17 that gives some reference to Christ's resurrection, to the Messiah, the Messianic. So Paul's saying... He arose on the third day according to Scripture, and then he appeared to Peter, and then he appeared to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, and some are still living. It's not like it was a 500-year gap between Christ's resurrection and the time that, the, time that you know, people were telling him about it. It was, it was close. People were still alive in those days. And then it says, verse 7, he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Who was James? James was a half-brother of Jesus, wasn't he? Now think of it, James, along with his family, they were not believers in Jesus Christ, right? They, they even said to Jesus, uh, Jesus, I think you need to leave Nazareth because you're kind of embarrassing us, you know, by telling us that you're the Messiah, you know, so could you leave, go down to Jerusalem, down to Judea? They were unbelievers. They weren't even there at the cross. The only one was his mother. What happened to James? He saw the resurrected Christ and he became a believer. And he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he suffered a martyr's death. Why? Because he saw the resurrected Jesus. Then to all the apostles, and then last of all, he talks about himself. To me, I, to me, appeared to me also as one abnormally born. For what he say? I'm the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Here was Paul, once a persecutor of the church, now a believer charged with spreading the gospel, the same gospel he once sought to destroy. Now how did this change occur? It occurred on the Damascus Road when he saw the risen Christ. And Paul, saw became Paul, and he became a representative of Christ, a proxy for Jesus acting on his behalf because he saw the resurrected Christ and he was converted 
And his whole mission changed, wasn't it? His whole mission changed. Has that ever happened to you? Once you come to grips with the risen Christ, you see a whole new vision that God wants for you. No longer are you satisfied with some of the things that you're doing in this world. You're satisfied with pleasing God, with doing God's work. You know? I think of Kevin and Melissa, that the work they're doing, you know, what he could be doing on a commercial airline or something, but he felt the call of God to be a missionary pilot, and God was calling him. I could go on and on, but Paul was a changed man. So quite frankly, without the resurrection, there would be no gospel. And that's what Paul's stating. Look at verses 13 through 19. What does he say there? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. How important is the resurrection? Absolutely important. Because if Christ is not raised from the dead, then Christianity is an illusion, a pious lie, a fantasy. And you're dead. And we all are dead in our sins, aren't we? We are the people to be most pitied if there's no resurrection because Christ has no power to save. And all it becomes to so many people today that don't believe in the resurrection is he becomes some great moral teacher. Oh, he maybe becomes a role model. And some might even say he's kind of crazy too, isn't he? All the things he said about himself, you know. He says some pretty outrageous things that a lot of gullible people believed. That's why C.S. Lewis, if you ever read Mere Christianity, says you can't have it both ways. You can't say that if you don't believe in a resurrected Christ, you can't say that he was a good moral teacher and a role model. Because if you, if you do that, you have to read what he said. And if you read what he said in the four Gospels, you've got to come away with the, with, the, with the position that he was a crazy guy. You know, something was wrong with him. So you can't have it both ways. Either he's the son of God, the resurrected from the dead, or he's a crazy guy. You can't have it both ways. Or I tell you what a lot of other so-called liberal churches do. They leave Christ on the cross. They go halfway, and they go no further, and they're never saved. There's a lot of people believe that. They believe in only one, only one fundamental truth of the gospel, and that's the cross, and they go no further and doesn't save them. I like what Billy Graham has written. He says this, we think of the cross as being the center of Christianity, and it is. And yet apart from the resurrection, the cross stands for death, not life. We can look at the cross all our lives and never be redeemed or saved. Isn't that true? What does Romans 10, 9 and 10 say? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that what? God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. Romans 4, 25, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The, Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential. That's why if you look at verse 20 of this chapter where Paul says, but Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have been fallen asleep. What he's saying is Christ has risen from the dead. He has risen indeed. Amen. Amen. That's why the cross and the resurrection are like bookends of the gospel. They're two fundamental truths woven throughout the New Testament. But you know what's glorious about this chapter and just what that verse I just read in verse 20, it says where it says here, it has been raised from the dead. Oh, excuse me, verse 20. But it has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Paul doesn't end with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died, meaning that Christ's resurrection, in a sense, is a pledge, a guarantee, an assurance of a future resurrection of the dead of us that are in Christ. 
In other words, the rising of the corpses. See, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you don't accept him as your personal savior, there's no hope of this resurrection. Oh, there's a future resurrection coming or the resurrection of the wicked. Right now in this chapter, he's talking about the resurrection of the righteous. And if you're not a believer, you're not part of that. What does it say in verse 22? For as in Adam all die. Isn't that true? In Adam we all died. In other words, we were all on that bus that Adam drove over the cliff. We were all on it. Whether we wanted to be on it or not, we were on it. And we're in the same sin as Adam was. But then what does he say further in 22? For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In other words, you accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you have a future resurrection of the dead. In other words, you're all going to be on the bus that God's taken to heaven. You're all on it. You're all on it. The first Adam, we died. In a sense, the second Adam, Christ, we were made alive. Now, I looked at verse 35. I told you I was going to jump around a little bit before I really get to the meat of the message. Verse 35 says, but someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? You ever ask that question? What are we going to look like? What if some little baby that died in infancy, what are they going to look like when they're resurrected? What is a guy that's 98 years old going to look like? Well, Paul addresses that, but not completely. So he goes in verse 36 here, and he, he begins, and I, I like how he begins this passage. First of all, he says, how foolish. Like, almost like, I told you this before, and you didn't listen. Okay, and I'm going to tell you it again. Okay, you're kind of foolish, so understand this. And he says this, what you sow does not come to life unless it, what, uh, unless it does what? It dies. Okay. And then he gives an example <clears throat> of a seed that's planted in the ground, and that seed dies. But once the seed is planted in the ground, what happens? The seed starts to take life. And that seed starts to grow up in the ground. In other words, a new life is formed. And this new life rises from the ground into something glorious, much more glorious than the seed that was planted. Understand that concept? We don't know how a seed that is planted in the ground comes to life. That's God's working. But somehow that seed that died first rises from the ground into a beautiful plant, much more glorious than that seed ever was. And that's what Paul's trying to say. And so with our bodies, he says this. Look at verse 38. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives it its own body. So in other words, what are we going to look like? All I can say is, as God has determined. As God has determined. So with our bodies like a seed planted in the ground, once in the ground, once we're buried, a new body comes to life fitted for heaven. One that he goes on that's imperishable, glorified, a spiritual body, just as God has chosen. It is a body that bears the image of Christ, right? What does it say in Philippians 3, 20 through 21? Christ will transform our lowly bodies into a glorious body like his. What do we look like? We'll look at something much more glorious than we... Do, would you want to look like you anyway, right? <clears throat> I mean, what are we going to look like? Our driver's license picture? You know? No, we're going to look at something that's so much glorious that we can't imagine. That's why Paul emphasizes in verse 50 here, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In a sense, what we look like now, we don't. We can't inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood, nor does the imperishable inherit, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. You're going to get a spiritual body. Do we understand this process? Of course not. See, God has determined that. It's a mystery. 
You know, just like a seed that's planted and suddenly it springs from the ground, blooming in beauty. So with our new bodies, no one understands exactly on a human level how this transformation takes place or occurs or what we're going to be our appearance. We must wait for the resurrection to find out. I like what Warren Wiersbe has written. He says, one day we shall bear the image of God. In the, one day we shall bear the image of the Savior when we share in his glory. Can you imagine that? One day we shall bear the image of the Savior when we share in his glory. So in a sense, Paul is saying, that's enough for now, okay? Believe this, believe what, and believe what you can't see, and that should be enough for you right now. Christ will transform our lowly bodies. And that's all we need to know, that we will be changed, that we will be changed. It says in verse 51, I tell you a mystery. Listen to this, I tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And he says this, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And when that occurs, our natural bodies are transformed into immortal bodies at the resurrection. That's why Paul writes in verses 54 and 50, through 54 through 56, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Isn't that a comforting thought? That Christ's resurrection has made victory over death and sin. That's amazing. For those who belong to Christ, Christ, death has finally lost its power to evoke fear and suffering, plucked out like a stinger from a bee. It no longer needs to be feared. Matter of fact, turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. Who is that? Satan. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. A believer should have no fear of death anymore because of the Christ's power over death. Because death simply becomes a portal, a passageway into the immediate presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, death's a great equalizer, isn't it? Famous or infamous, rich or poor, we all have a rendezvous with death. And the people handle death differently, don't they? Some die with confidence, others die in, in despair. Some die rejoicing, others die with regret and remorse. And some die in great fear, others die in great serenity. A believer should die in great serenity because we know the victory has already been won. So we have that promise. There should be no fear of death. You know, in John Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress, anybody ever read that? If you haven't, you should. It's a great allegor allegorical story of the Christian faith. He writes of a guy by the name of Mr. Fearing who dreaded death all his life and likened it to the crossing of the Jordan River by the children of Israel. When Mr. Fearing reached the river, however, the waters were at a record low, and he crossed over not much above wet shod, meaning he thought he was going to get fear it so much that the river was going to be so high, but when he got there, he kind of just waded through it, you know. And wait, that's the Christian's death. J.I. Packer writes, dying well is one of the good works to which Christians are called, and Christ will enable us who serve him to die well. We can die well because we know what awaits us and because of the work that Christ has done on the cross and the power of the resurrection, because Christianity is not a lie and it's not in vain and it's true. We can die well. There's a story of a young boy. This is way back in 1907. 
and he was dying. He loved to sing Fanny Crosby's hymns. I mean, we still sing some of those today. <clears throat> it was September 1907, and a visitor from England sought out Fanny Crosby. So she said this, while my son Will was sick, she said he was constantly singing your hymns. Several hospital patients who knew him confessed Christ through his singing of blessed assurance. When he returned home, he kept singing your songs. And one evening he said, Mother, don't leave me. Give me my hymn book. I want to sing safe in the arms of Jesus. And when he reached the line, Hark to the voice of angels, he dropped the book and his face lighted up and he whispered, Ma, there are the angels, there are the fields of glory. And then he slipped away to be forever with his Lord. That's the dying of a believer. Is that what happened to that young boy? Or was it just an illusion caused by a flood of natural opiates called endorphins that wash over the brain, bringing on both tranquility and hallucinations that death draws near? Is that what it was? Is that the medical science explanation of this young boy that died seeing the fields of glory and the angels? Or did he really see it? Because if it's not true, if he didn't see that, then that boy's body is still in the grave, decaying. And there's no hope beyond the grave. But I believe firmly that that young boy saw the angels and he saw the fields of glory and a spirit went immediately to the presence of the Lord and he will await someday the resurrection of his body. That's why a believer has no fear of death. Death to me is like a ship that sails from its port. We're all standing on the seashore, aren't we? And as that ship sails over the horizon, what do we say? We say, goodbye, we'll see you. So long. But then what happens? On the other side of the sea, there are voices that are saying what? There she comes. <laughs> there she comes. She's coming right now. That's what? We leave someone for a brief period of time. And when that person dies in, uh, in Christ, People, the angels are singing, I'm sure. And Christ is saying, here you come. That's death for a believer. And finally, in chapter 50, verse 58, what happens here? Paul says this, Therefore, after all I've said to you, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because what? You know that your labor is not in vain. And the Lord, your labor is not, no matter what you do, if you hold firm to the truth, stand fast, be steadfast, your labor is not in vain. We want you to always abounding in the work of the Lord because we have a risen Christ, the first fruits, and we will soon follow. That's why the resurrection is the necessary foundation for faithful action in this world because our future is settled and the victory has been won. That is, he say in verse 57, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, in a sense, was telling these Corinthians, hold firm to what I've been telling you. Hold firm. Read this letter. Take it to heart. Be steadfast. Don't be swayed by these other false doctrines that are coming up. Don't be swayed by Hellenism. Don't be swayed by some of this thinking of the Sadducees. Stand firm. You know, do what I tell you to do. Hold fast to my teaching. We do the same thing, right? We hold fast to this teaching that's contained in this word. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, isn't it? So hold fast to it. Don't doubt in the dark what you saw in the light. Don't doubt in the dark what you saw in the light. And don't give up. Because in due time, you will reap your reward. Because that's just as your labor is not in vain. So do something that counts for eternity. I was going to tell you anything after all that we taught, all that's been said tonight. Do something that's really going to count for eternity because you know your labor's not in vain. I was thinking the other day, one man, one man led D.L. Moody to Jesus Christ, Ed Kimball. Never heard of him probably. But that man went to that shoe store and put his arms around D.L. Moody and said, God loves you and I love you and you need to come to Christ. And D.L. Moody went, came to Christ. One man led D.L. Moody to Christ. How many people did D.L. Moody lead to Christ? Probably thousands. Well, lead someone to Christ. You never know the reward you're going to get in heaven. 
Do what you're, do what God's calling you to do and do it heartily and with joy because it says here, your labor's not in vain in the Lord because the victory's been won. Christ is resurrected. You're going to soon follow in due time. So trust in him, trust in his word, and you, and you, will, you will be blessed by it. I'm sure you will. So let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the presentation by the Boers. Thank you for the singing, all that we've done to praise and worship you. So much that we can be thankful for. But now we pray tonight that uh, whatever has been said tonight, we'll take it to heart. And we know that our work is not in vain. We, we trust you. We give you the glory. We want to serve you better. We want to lead others to Christ. We want to do the work of the Lord that will give you glory. We thank you, Lord, for what you've given us tonight. Be with us as we go home. Be with us for the rest of the week that we will magnify you. There will be a good testimonies for Christ in the, world, in the work day and wherever we do this week. Thank you for all that you've given us. In Christ's name, amen.